Our next speaker is James Prestwick. He's the CEO of Suma, and he's going to talk to us about uh, cross-chain communication. Welcome, James. All right. Uh, hi, I'm James. Um, I have a company called Suma, and we also are starting a nonprofit called Crosschain Group to work on projects like this. Uh, this is going to be a non-technical talk about a very technical subject. Um, so uh, it's the state of cross-chain communication. Um, over the last week, BISC reported, what, nine trades in the last seven days, totaling 0.63 Bitcoin in total volume. Uh, so uh, that's the state of cross-chain communication. Um, I'm happy to take <laughs> questions now. Um, jokes aside, uh, I do have an actual presentation. Um, so generally speaking, that's going to be the theme, is nobody uses cross-chain communication today. Uh, there's a great systemization of knowledge paper, uh, which is right here. You should all go read it. It's by Alexei Zamyatin, Mustafa al Bassam, and a few other people, and I'm going to be citing it over and over and over throughout the talk. Uh, we're basically going to go over this paper, all the constructions for cross-chain communication, and where they are in terms of implementation, who's working on them, when we expect them to launch, and who's funding them. Uh, so again, like after the talk, go download this paper. It will tell you everything you need to know about the theory. So we're particularly interested in things without trusted third parties. Um, uh, in the paper, the trusted third party is in the sense of a fair exchange protocol. Uh, really go read the paper for an understanding of what that is. And uh, for the purposes of like engineering and like relating to people, we're going to slightly modify their definition of trusted third party. Uh, so if you look here at SPV protocols, uh, in the fair exchange context, they would be considered to have a trusted third party. However, that trusted third party is a smart contract. And so from the engineering perspective, we usually don't consider them to have a trusted third party involved. In SPV specifically, that's a smart contract that verifies chain state, uh, the consensus process of the remote chain. Um, so here are things I think aren't interesting at all. Uh, custodial exchanges and uh, custodial atomic swaps. We're not going to talk about those. Everybody knows how Coinbase works. Okay, so there are a few companies that are building novel swaps. Uh, first is Arwin. Uh, so I think Ethan's around here, over there. Hi, Ethan. Um, and I haven't seen Sharon today, but I'm sure she's around. Uh, Arwin works on, uh, they have their own line in this paper, which is really cool. They work on, uh, layer two exchange protocols. So Arwin is a family of related protocols that use asymmetric escrows between the user and an exchange. And this is a diagram of what these escrows are, how Bitcoin flows through one, two, three, four, five, six transactions, uh, only a few of which ever go on chain, and how Litecoin on the other side flows through a different set of six transactions, hopefully you know, only one or two of which go on chain. Um, so Arwin can be used for semi-trusted exchange, and it's a custom layer two protocol. Uh, so when you connect to an exchange, uh, they can troll you, but they can't steal your funds. The worst they can do to you is cause a lockup of funds for longer than you expect. Um, and an exchange that you trust, interact, and trade with probably won't do that. Um, Arwin has protocols for limit orders, RFQs, partial fills, and it's really cool because it works with uh, every Bitcoin variant, even those without SegWit. Um, so Arwin is built by Arwin, the company. Uh, they are, I think, live today, but it's a little difficult to use. You can probably go out and download testnet software and actually execute these swaps. Um, this is my vanity section. Uh, we'll get a couple other vanity sections throughout the presentation. Um, so Suma has worked on SPV-based swaps and exchange a lot over the past few years. Uh, my entire MIT talk last year was about SPV-based swaps. Um, so essentially the way SPV works is you have a smart contract to directly verify the consensus protocol of the other chain. 
So you have an Ethereum contract that reads Bitcoin headers and uh, can parse Bitcoin transactions and verify that a certain thing happened. Uh, so this requires either stateless SPV with some weird security assumptions or an ongoing chain relay where you actually take each Bitcoin header and put it into Ethereum. Uh, we've been running one of those on Covan testnet for like six to eight months now, uh, but haven't bothered taking it mainnet because there's just not a user base out there for it. Um, so you can have an optional trusted third party that makes the protocol much smoother. Uh, the trusted third party, again, can't steal funds. They can just delay things. Um, and in the future, this will work on Ethereum layer two to Bitcoin layer one as well. Uh, okay, and so the last one that's building interesting swaps is a company called Red uh, Radar with their product Redshift. Uh, so Redshift is a pretty simple atomic swap, like Tier Nolan style, but done on Lightning. So Redshift does live swaps from Lightning to mainnet Bitcoin and Lightning Bitcoin to Ethereum and stable coins. Uh, this can be done in browser, uh, so it's just through MetaMask and any merchant that supports Lightning. Uh, you can actually go to their webpage and use this interface and you know, like paste a Lightning invoice into a box and have it just work. On the back end, they're connecting out to a bunch of market makers who are uh, providing the liquidity on each pair and taking a spread. Um, it's actually you know, used by people in practice today. Um, so there aren't that many interesting swap companies aside from that. Like we talked about BISC and we said they're doing essentially $6,000 of volume a week. Uh, but the, the trends for the new swaps are pretty good with the exception of SUMA that nobody's using at all. Uh, it's interesting because Lightning Bitcoin is at the center of this ecosystem. Um, it's not Bitcoin. Uh, Lightning Bitcoin is the center of basically all cross-chain trades. Um, and the other like, really interesting thing is that Lightning Bitcoin to mainnet Bitcoin dominates that. Uh, the vast majority of cross-chain communication is happening between Lightning and mainnet. Uh, so this is like surprising, and it's not at all what we thought atomic swaps would be used for when they got invented six years ago. Uh, after Lightning to mainnet, the most common use case is from Lightning Bitcoin to Ethereum stablecoins. Uh, and after that, like, basically nobody uses these at all. It's just Lightning to mainnet Bitcoin and Lightning to stablecoins. Uh, so now that we've covered swaps, uh, we wanna talk about asset portability. This is the idea that you should be able to take Bitcoin and represent it on some other chain, or you should, uh, you should have a token that's actually redeemable for Bitcoin, right? Uh, so there are a lot of ways to accomplish this. This is the same table, but you can see it's three times as large. Uh, there are so many different approaches. Um, so we're gonna start with sharded systems. Uh, this is your ETH2, your near protocol, um, there are a couple well-funded sharded ecosystems. Uh, NIR has their own custom thing. Ethereum has their own custom thing that doesn't exist yet. Uh, NIR has one logical chain with execution sharded, while ETH2 will have many logical chains with sharded execution. Um, it's questionable like when these are going to launch. NIR seems optimistic they can launch this year. Uh, ETH2 Phase zero might launch this year, but it won't have shards or transactions, uh, so it's hardly something we can even call a chain. Uh, so it's questionable when sharded ETH2 will actually launch. It's looking like late 2021 at earliest. Uh, NIR is primarily VC funded, so they've pre-sold tokens as their primary way of funding, and ETH2 is funded primarily by Consensus and the Ethereum Foundation. Um, okay. So side chains have been a topic of conversation for something like eight years now, and we still don't have any good ones in production. We have a few federated side chains, like Liquid, uh, which I'm gonna kind of gloss over for this talk. Um, and we have a few upcoming like side chain oriented ecosystems. So Cosmos is run by the Interchain Foundation and like three other companies. Uh, it's using the Tendermint BFT consensus system with proof of stake. 
The idea of Cosmos is you have a bunch of chains that all side chain each other and have disparate security models, and uh, you validate the assets by direct observation. Is if you want to move an asset from one chain to another, you better verify both chains, otherwise you won't know if the representation is good. Uh, Polkadot tries to do a similar thing, but with a unified security system, is you know that the asset is good because the system as a whole enforces it. Um, this means that Polkadot has a lot more synchrony between its parachains and Cosmos zones can progress at independent rates. Uh, Cosmos Hub is live today, uh, but only supports simple asset transfers and there are no Cosmos zones. So like Cosmos as an ecosystem doesn't exist yet. Uh, Polkadot is much the same, is they've deployed like a sort of incentivized test net called Kusama, but it really doesn't exist yet. Um, the paper has a section that I have labeled weird things. Um, we, we don't really need to talk about these. Uh, proof of burn is not really asset portability. You actually like destroy something and you can't get it back. Uh, merged mining is not asset portability either. Like it's a way of unifying consensus systems. And randomness beacons don't let you move assets either. So we're just gonna like skip this whole section basically. Um, we're also gonna skip Doge Theorem, which is another weird thing that doesn't really exist. Uh, it, it's basically what it sounds like. Um, so uh, that kind of brings us to the asset portability things, the bridges that we can instantiate today. Uh, so right now, live, you have WBTC, uh, which is a trusted federation. So BitGo is holding 885 Bitcoin uh, and issues an ERC-20 token that is a claim on those assets. Uh, you also have ZBTC, which is from REN and is managed by their ChaosNet, uh, which is kind of a live mainnet testnet. Uh, and REN uh, ZBTC has 0.32 Bitcoin in it. So about $3,000, uh, 3,500 say. Uh, and then we have the trusted bridges, and I forgot to put a third bullet point here, so just ignore that. These exist today, uh, they work. Uh, Chainbridge is a chain safe project. They're a company based out of Toronto. Uh, notionally will work for Cosmos and Polkadot and Ethereum and ETH Classic. But uh, only Ethereum and ETH Classic exist today, so uh, we can only really say it works for those. Um, Chainsafe is primarily funded by contracts with the Web3 Foundation that's behind the Polkadot ecosystem and with the Interchain Foundation that runs the Cosmos ecosystem. Not runs, but funds encourages adoption of markets, et cetera. Uh, so we have a couple like trusted bridges today, but we, uh, and like the near bridge, uh, but near doesn't have a main net yet either. So essentially like all of these trusted models are test nets. They're just like people playing around with the code. And it's questionable whether all of these main nets are going to launch and then it's at least six to 12 months after that before the bridges really launch. Uh, so in the next few months, we're going to see a few more bridges built and launched. So I've worked on TBTC with a few other people. Uh, we expect this to go live in April. It's working on a uh, like bonded federation approach. So the way TBTC works is essentially you give your Bitcoin to a custodian uh, who is bonded and you can revoke the bond if that Bitcoin disappears. Um, if, you, if the bond is revoked, it's used to purchase TBTC from the market to make the token holders whole. Um, very similar design is Xclaim. So this is by Alexei Zamyatin, who wrote the SOK that I've been referencing heavily. Uh, Xclaim is currently spec'd for Bitcoin to Polkadot. Uh, I should say cross-claim. I think they say call it cross-claim. So cross-claim is spec'd for Bitcoin to Polkadot. This spec was released publicly about two weeks ago. Um, it seems likely that Interlay, the company who designed the spec, will be contracted to build it. And so we'd expect to see code for that in six months or so. Uh, at, but again, like Polkadot doesn't exist. So we're building technology speculatively to bridge Bitcoin into an ecosystem that is not nearly launch ready. Uh, okay, so bridges tomorrow, we're talking, uh, in six, 12, 18 months, we expect to see IBC, which is Cosmos's uh, 
cross-chain communication and asset portability framework. Uh, we don't know when this is going to be mainnet. The spec has been finalized fairly recently in just the last few months. Uh, this is worked on primarily by the Interchain Foundation, Agoric Systems, and uh, Interchain Berlin. Um, and then maybe someday we'll get to ZK Rollout, which was an in-house design that we came up with uh, to extend roll-ups from Ethereum to the cross-chain uh, setting. But uh, nobody's currently building that. It's a like, fuzzy design and probably won't be built. So this is like at least three to five years off. Um, so this is kind of who's working on it. We have Arwin and Suma and Radar working on cross-chain trades. Uh, we're seeing adoption in L2. We have Chainsafe and Near and Web3 and Cosmos and Interlay working on all of the asset portability stuff. And uh, the vast majority of that is six to 12 months out. Um, it's interesting because a lot of this research is funded by the Web3 Foundation and by the Interchain Foundation. So of the companies on this like slide, only Arwin and Radar are not funded by Web3 or Interchain. Um, like the vast majority of the work in asset portability is being financed by a relatively small set of the ecosystem. Okay, so we have a few key takeaways from this. Uh, trades are moving to L2. Uh, layer one cross-chain communication never took off. We never started atomic swapping things. It's going nowhere. Uh, trades favor stable coins, uh, either because it's Bitcoin to Bitcoin or because it's Bitcoin to something that tracks the dollar. Uh, like the trades are favoring DAI and USDC, um, which is unexpected and potentially very interesting. Uh, we don't know where this like trade ecosystem is going to go, but it looks like it's not going towards Ethereum. Um, Sharding and sidechain orgs finance most of the work. I've already brought this up about Web3 and Cosmos. Is essentially people who are building their ecosystem around cross-chain comms are the ones financing the research into cross-chain comms. So in the end, most of this money is coming from the tokens that were sold to finance those ecosystems. Uh, and trusted federations have beat everything to market but have no adoption. So WBTC being 880 Bitcoin is essentially an irrelevant part of the Bitcoin ecosystem. Uh, it's a tiny, tiny amount of value. So like trusted federations are early, but no one uses them. And uh, Bitcoin is still the center of this ecosystem. Uh, however, trusted Ethereum bridges are growing rapidly. Like we have a half dozen of these under development by different teams. Uh, and when you talk to new protocols like Near and like uh, Polkadot, they're interested in bridging to Ethereum, uh, possibly more than in bridging to Bitcoin. They're more interested in uh, calling Ethereum contracts than they seem to be in moving Bitcoin over to the new chain. Uh, so that's like kind of the state of cross-chain communication, is it's super early, basically nothing effective is deployed. We have a few teams working on very interesting trades that are taking off and like performing useful services, but none of the asset portability is anywhere near ready. And we're still on like this trusted federations that are launching in advance of the chains they intend to serve. Uh, I'm happy to take questions. Uh, yeah, so I was curious about how you think uh, Interledger relates to some of this stuff as sort of a level three protocol for exchanging assets across chains. Uh, so, sorry, do we have water? Um, I've been talking for like 15, 20 minutes. Thank you. Um, so I'm actually a big fan of ILP. Uh, they've had some team shakeups recently, but it looks like, you know, they're still going to go in a good direction. Um, I have generally some uh, issues with like where people in this industry divide layers. I would call Lightning and ILP both layer three protocols. Mm -hmm. um, but really, ILP might be useful for trades. Uh, no one seems to be building that. Uh, there isn't like an ILP exchange out there that's acquiring customers. 
So while I'm optimistic about it in the long run, it doesn't seem to be deploying anything in the near future. Yeah, sounds good. Hi, uh, thanks. And uh, so if I had a DAO on Ethereum, let's call it James DAO, hypothetically, and James DAO is hosting on IPFS, but is kind of frustrated with the load times and the pins going down all the time, and it wanted to try out Skynet, but it has to pay for Skynet automatically through a smart contract in SIA coins. Is that possible or anywhere near possible? Uh, that is certainly possible um, with some like security assumptions. So you would build something that's TBTC-like with bonded federations that are in control of the SIA coins and responsible for performing certain actions. Uh, building something like that would probably take upwards of 12 months to do effectively, and you'd have to start very much from the ground up, uh, implementing SIA's consensus in Solidity. Uh, I'm, that's not a joke, is uh, like most of my day job is implementing Bitcoin's heaviest chain rule in other chains. Uh, we've done this in Solidity, C, Go, Rust, JavaScript, and I'm sure I'm forgetting one of them. So it, it sounded kind of like you were um, you were like dancing around a couple of thoughts that you had when you were saying, "Oh yeah, like you know nobody's really funding these cross-chain communication platforms." Uh, so what are your thoughts on on why um, you know maybe there's more funding going into like maybe just um, like Ethereum stable coins uh, switching instead of like Bitcoin to Ethereum? Uh, so like TBTC is fairly well funded, and WBTC is run by a collection of like fairly well funded orgs, right? It's not that there's a lack of funding going into this, it's that there's a lack of users. Um, nobody seems to have a solid use case for this. The first you know, like, real uses we're seeing are on layer two with trades, and that might go somewhere. But in the meantime, for people who are working on like the asset portability protocols and who are working on bridges uh, and the other like more in-depth interoperability solutions, we're basically all doing this speculatively on the idea that eventually this will be useful. And so it's very difficult to get funding for that idea. Um, and you know, as a like, guy who does this full time, I would be very reluctant to take funding for this idea because it does not look like there is a useful product on the horizon. I guess I, I should have rephrased my, my question better. So you said like specifically people or users are more interested in using like USDT and DAI. Right, so, so why do you think that is? Uh, so users are more interested in USDT than DAI. Uh, this is probably for historical reasons. Um, I'm not a huge user of stable coins myself, so I won't speculate on other people's motives. Um, it's just that generally speaking, like we see people want to trade Bitcoin to USDT and DAI more than we see them want to trade Bitcoin to Ether. Thanks. Mm -hmm. How quickly you've all forgotten about shapeshift.io, but, uh, <laughs> but there are others, xmr.to and stuff. Where would they fit in your schema of uh, cross-chain? Uh, well, they fit into the trusted exchange category that I you know, ruled out as fairly uninteresting early on. So they're not as trustless as they claim to be? Well, like Shapeshift was a counterparty to every trade made on their platform. You, know, you send money to Shapeshift, they get the money and send uh, different coins back to you. Like, you give, you hand them your money and then they hand different money back. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, so like, they fit into trusted exchange. Is They're not a cryptographic or economic mechanism. Um, so like, those are probably very good businesses, but uh, they don't really fit into the subject of the talk. Do you have any thoughts about a WAN chain? None at all. Uh, any other any other questions? I, I can throw more shade. <laughs> if you could invent a magic cryptographic primitive to make your life easier, what would it, what would it look like? Um, in, in the context of interchange communication. Uh, 
so in a sense, like I feel like that has happened with a lot of the ZK snarks. Um, some of the like proof of stake light client protocols are extremely efficient with snarks. And you get this efficiency essentially because proof of stake sacrifices part of the security model. Um, but in a, in a sense, like that magic cryptography is snarks and starks and other ZKPs. If there was one additional extra magic thing I would wish for that uh, I don't know if is possible, it would be witness encryption. Uh, yeah, it's like, it's super extra magic. Um, yeah, it's like zero knowledge proofs, but on crack. Um, uh, there are some like cryptographic primitives like that that we speculate might exist but have no good constructions for that would make this really easy. Um, witness encryption just because we could make private keys that were revealed if and only if you, you know, like knew some information about the remote chain. Like there's all kinds of crazy things you can do with it. Um, I haven't thought too deeply about that question because uh, I tend to keep my plans and designs in the realm of things I think I could reasonably build within six months. Um, any other like questions? We good? Cool, I think I wrapped up like 15 minutes early. 